We are not connected to the World Wide Web at the moment, uh, which is... Do people say that anymore? About that. Anyway, we're, this is all in person, not remote, and uh, so we are it, um, plus whoever's about to walk in the door and uh, straggle in. So thank you all for being here at Boers, and thank you for coming to this session. Um, it's very interesting to all of us, I'm sure. Those of you, most of you hopefully know a lot about, well, have, are, are not learning about PFOS for the first time. It's been in the news a lot here in Vermont and increasingly nationwide. Uh, lots of recent news about PFOS. Uh, but we're going to operate uh, with the assumption that everybody's got some baseline knowledge of what PFOS is. And uh, because we only have not even 60 minutes, we're down to 57 seven minutes. <laughs> uh, and it's not enough time. Whereas, you know, we could talk for hours about this stuff and we don't have it. Uh, but um, we do contaminants. You know, we're calling PFAS a contaminant of uh, concern for compost, for organics in general. It's in a lot of other things, as we'll hear, that aren't compost and organics. But since we're talking about those things, that's what the focus for today. Uh, and there are other opportunities to talk about these things later in the week. Uh, on Thursday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, Pam will be Pam and Caleb will be uh, joining us for a separate panel online, uh, talking about contaminants of concern, um, talking about persistent herbicides, talking about PFAS, and the other one is microplastics. Um, will be a uh, representative from a DPAC um, uh, business at that session. So hopefully. Those with that uh, time slot open, check your schedule uh, for the online portion, and hopefully you can make that. Um, so, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, PFOS, um, we are going to jump right into, let's just give you uh, some idea what this format's going to be and what we're going to pull off in the remaining 52 minutes and 12 seconds. I'm going to give you, tell you who is with me. Uh, and then I'm going to let them briefly talk about how it is that uh, PFOS shows up in their work. Um, we're very, well, shows up in their work. And then uh, I have a couple of questions. And again, I'm going to try to really limit um, responses. Everybody's going to talk really fast. I know usually that's not what you're um, suggested for a conference or a speak engagement. We're going to change the rules today, though, because we need to get a lot of talking in. And I've got my timer out now. Um, and as somebody who happens to be verbose themselves, this could be a big challenge, but um, well, I'm gonna give them all a couple of minutes to talk about that, and then I've got a couple of questions, and then the good part is we're gonna open it up to all of you to ask your questions um, and grill them on the latest and greatest of PFAS in Vermont and beyond, um, and we're gonna get started. So. We're really lucky to have them all. Uh, these folks all work a lot with PFAS. Well, uh, I don't think any of them chose to work with PFAS, but they are all working with PFAS because it is here, it is among us, and we are learning more about it. And it's um, we're fortunate that we have so many folks in the Northeast, but particularly even in Vermont and uh, Maine, we'll see a big overlap with the state of Maine, um, that we're able to get folks in person to join us today. So. Without further ado, we have Pam Breyer, Breyer, Breyer sorry, um, who is the new agrochemical toxicologist with Vermont Agency of Ag Food and Markets. Um, in that role, she helps multiple programs assess risk from a wide array of chemical inputs, not just PFAS. Her background is in environmental toxicology, and she has experience in academia, industry, and most recently in government as a science advisor to a pesticide regulatory board. And it doesn't say so in here, but Pam comes from Maine, where we uh, there was a lot of PFAS attention, uh, rightly so. And um, to Pam's right is Eamon Toig, who joined Vermont DEC in 2012, um, which was a big year for herbicides in compost, <laughs> as, as an aside. You know about that? I heard something about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and Pam actually will be speaking more about herbicides, uh, persistent herbicides, later in the week. Um, uh, Amen holds the unofficial record of serving in the greatest number of divisions over the shortest time uh, at the state. And in 2017, uh, he enlisted with Waste Management and Prevention Division as the manager of the Residuals Waste and Emerging Contaminants Program. Chief among the duties of this program, ensuring beneficial reuse of residual materials, such as biosolids, is performed in a matter that protects the environment and human health, made more difficult with the discovery of PFAS. 
or not discovery, but the uh, appearance of more and more of it, no doubt. Um, and the major focus of the program is to assist the state with investigations around regulatory response to per and plural, polyfluoral alkyl substances uh, in our environment. So prior to working for the state, he conducted research at UVM, the university here in Vermont, focusing on reducing pollutant and excess nutrient loading to surface and groundwaters via innovative low-cost technologies such as constructed wetlands and phosphorus-sorbing filters. And to Eamon's right, we have Caleb Gossin, is it? Go, go, oh, Caleb Goosen, who started as the organic crop specialist for the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. Prior to that, he farmed for nine years in Vermont, worked at Vermont's oldest nursery, and had brief horticultural adventures in Belize and New Zealand. He looks up to his awesome older brother and... <laughs> oh, that's it. Um, no relation. And then to his right, uh, we have Andrew Carpenter, who is a certified soil scientist, uh, also from the state of Maine. Um, did, oh yeah, so Caleb Maine, Pam Maine, Andrew Maine. We got a lot of Maine representation. All in Waldo County. <laughs> Same county, Maine. Not, not one of the biggest counties either, in terms of population. I think uh, Waterbury might exceed it. Um, so, uh, where were we? Hammond. Uh, so Andrew, yes, uh, he's been the recycling organic, res he has been recycling organic residuals and developing recycling programs for materials that have not historically been reused since 1992. He has extensive experience in research planning and handling technical issues related to the reuse of organic residuals. Andrew founded Northern Tilth LLC, an environmental consulting firm focusing on organic waste management and building soil health in 2003. Andrew is currently a trustee of the Compost Research and, Research and Education Foundation, which is part of the U.S. Composting Council. And uh, Andrew has been with us at prior um, VORS, multiple VORS um, events over the years and has been a, an important voice for PFAS and other uh, beneficial reuse um, issues that have come up over the years. So again, very happy to have all of these. And I'm going to now pass it to each uh, of our panelists to talk a little bit about how PFAS shows up in their work. Um, and uh, then we're going to jump into some questions, and then I'll open it up to you. So we're going to start with Pam, who has a couple of slides to show. I have a brain of Swiss cheese. So I have some prompts. This is my contact information. Part of what you should know is if you ever have questions, you should reach out to the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. We are here to help you. Two different email addresses to reach me by and my phone number. So please reach out. Next slide. So the Agency of Ag recognized a number of years ago that this is a pressing issue and started devoting resources to understanding PFAS in Vermont. And then PCBs in schools um, intersected some of those resources, but um, for a number of years we've been building capacity at our laboratory to do PFAS testing. Pretty soon we'll have online two different EPA approved methods for testing of PFAS in water, biosolids, and all the other matrices of interest. Um, it is, and again, I just don't want to skate over this. It is a a priority of the agency to ensure that we prevent PFAS from entering ag soils. There's no better way to get around that. One of the things that's different in Vermont than in other states is we have a little more thorough vetting of fertilizers. So sometimes biosolids products can be analyzed for nutrients, called a fertilizer, and applied to farmland that way. And in Vermont, we register our fertilizers in a way that goes beyond just the nutrient verification consumer protection stuff. So we do a label review. The labels of registered fertilizers are available to you. This QR code or that um, URL, you could look up the brand name of any fertilizer registered in Vermont and see if it has biosolids as a component. The other thing that we're doing is we're working, because it's popular with state agencies, on a website. That's um, to come very shortly. We're trying to get helpful information out there because I think one of our important roles is going to be assisting producers as they navigate what to do when they find PFAS on their properties. Next slide, please. Under Vermont law, because it, my slide didn't say compost, I want you guys to know that under Vermont law, a soil amendment is where uh, compost legally fits. Next slide. So I have an interesting position in that I do liaise with different parts of the agency. Obviously, we work with residuals. The largest volume 
of inputs to agricultural systems for PFAS would be via biosolids. But they can also come in as contaminants. They can come in as contaminants from rain, from unintended um, contamination, so anything that comes out of a fluorinated container, so fertilizers, uh, pesticides, adjuvants, anything can be contaminated with PFAS, and that's a farm input of concern. One of the other things, and it's really not, it's, I've wasted way too much of my life talking about the definition of PFAS, but it is a part of my life. And the broad definition, there's a very good reason why we go as a society for the broadest definition because of how this has been managed in the past. But it's now pulling in a number of products that we rely on. So for instance, um, the, vet, the state vet was really concerned because one of the primary veterinary anesthetics that is used is considered PFAS today. So as we move forward with legislation, that's a, something I work on. We have to, of course, ensure that commodities are safe for consumption. We have to protect Vermont's uh, reputation as being able to produce safe commodities. Those are things the agency works on. And at the same time, we can't be worsening the inputs of PFAS into the environment around us. We were talking a little bit about farm value and when you find that you have PFAS on your property, how does that change the landscape of your property? Last week, EPA made a big announcement with PFOS and PFOA you know, being involved in CERCLA. This introduces a new wave of litigation for farmers. They have been specifically told they're exempt, uh, but I do think that a lot more growers and producers will be dealing with lawyers in the future. In remediation, what do we do? And that's one of, the, one of the big things that we want to be able to do is help people navigate their choices as growers. When you have a property and you have a farm, what can you do with your soil? And that's one of our roles. Next slide. Again, that slide didn't have compost on it, but it's really there under the farm inputs. Next slide. And that's all. <laughs> Great. All right. Andrew. Uh, no, sorry. Andrew, we can go in order. Uh, okay. Tell us how PFAS shows up in your work. Uh, every day in an email. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so, you know, DEC, um, I don't speak for all of DEC. I don't represent all of DEC. I'll say that first and foremost. But my direct experience has been uh, mostly related to wastewater. Um, Vermont started testing wastewater at treatment plants in 2017. Um, 2016, if you count Bennington. So it was sort of like this expanding universe, and it was happening really fast. Um, from, gee, follow the contaminant, and where could it have gone from here? And, um, you know, we started really small and cautiously, and over time, we really built quite a big data set and have a pretty broad understanding of of how PFAS is getting into our wastewater plants, what's happening to it while it's there, and then ultimately what happens to it when it leaves that plant. And unfortunately, um, wastewater plants get the finger pointed at them a lot as you know sources of, of PFAS. I understand it's a matter of language, but um, if you're in the industry, it's really troubling to hear that because those people are there providing an incredible public service and they have a lot of pride in what they do. Um, and they don't want to be labeled as, you know, as a source. So a lot of it is sort of turning our heads a little bit around, OK, yes, it's coming out of the pipe. Or yes, it's ending up in the solids, which we call sludge, and could become biosolids. And certainly not all sludges become biosolids. Um, I think the most important thing is, is that we work with our municipalities to make sure that they're aware of the testing options, to know what they're receiving and potentially what they're putting out so that they can make decisions based on that. Maybe biosolids aren't for every plant, but they can certainly be made at, at, at a lot of them. I think Vermont generally has a domestic wastewater input relative to many other areas of the country. So. Um, when you look at the raw numbers at some of the plants, relative to other major municipalities, the numbers are pretty low, which you'd probably expect in Vermont. There's a great study out of California with a lot of domestic wastewater plants, it's really similar to what we see. But if you compare it to like Michigan, where they've got chrome plating industry directly discharging into a wastewater plant, 
or a paper processing facility in Maine that's directly discharging to a solar plant. We don't, we're not seeing those, those numbers, which is really good. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do something about it. So right now, one of our major focuses is looking upstream. We have been trying to lean more upstream, um, trying to get at sources, and there's gonna be a combination of techniques that are gonna be used there. We have industrial pretreatment options already. A lot of it's gonna be education. Um, how do you get this stuff out of the consumer world? without doing, you know, you can do legislative bans, but they take time and how do we inform consumers? I mean, we all know PFAS, but most people don't know PFAS. And my elevator pitch is like 10 minutes long. So I mean, it's, <laughs> you, can, you can't explain PFAS to somebody quickly. So um, we got a lot of work to do on the, on the source reduction side. So that's really what I'm looking forward to in the long run here. And I think that will affect everything, not just wastewater, but where this stuff goes, hits us, hits the environment. So. Great. Yeah, thanks. Caleb. Yeah, so I'm Caleb Goosen. I work as a crop specialist for the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, which is a role very similar to an extension position, like Vern Grubinger here with our growers in Vermont. Um, but I work for a nonprofit. And I was born and raised in Bennington, and I used to jump off of a covered bridge and swim in the river right by the ChemFed plant. So I probably have some exposure historically from that. There also used to be a Kleenex paper mill that was associated with the dam that we jumped by. Anyway, uh, so I didn't realize I was going to be involved with PFAS. And then in about 2021, I started um, connecting with some extension and state folks in Maine um, with an organic dairy, because I work with primarily organic farms, um, but not exclusively. and. Um, the state had, in its discovery of PFAS, you know, the first farm, it was um, drinking water well testing that led to finding this farm's been contaminated. Then the state, after the change of administration, and Janet Mills became our governor, created a PFAS task force, and they said, essentially, well, how do we know if that's too much or not? And so they set a threshold for milk. And we're still the only state that has thresholds for what's allowable in milk and beef. Right now, we're still working off of those old thresholds. We have calculated new thresholds that have not yet been implemented for milk, beef, but also yogurt, pork, spinach, potatoes, and something else. But uh, the idea, the problem is that Maine has been essentially doing these on a one by one, as needed basis. Basically, okay, we just found contamination. This farm grows this. Is that too much or not? Um, and so uh, it's, and then also this investigation that has been kicked off um, has led to the realization that as we discover more and more of where it is and what might be too much, and as the national numbers and advisories about what is too much for uh, people to be getting, at least from a risk standpoint, continue to decrease, then that means the numbers that you might determine to be allowable in a food product are also continuing to decrease, though that maybe hasn't been enacted yet. Um, PFOS, PFOA, the two that we really know about, the ones that just got that CERCLA designation, the ones that we finally now have in a EPA drinking water standard, there are also some others that got added to that. We're about, it took about 24 years for that to really happen uh, because we've known maybe not quite as low of the levels that are, are considering a risk, but we've known that low levels were a risk and the companies that make them have known for even longer. Um, so then that fall, I got called by another one of our farms, a veggie farm. And they said, hey, now that the state's doing this investigation, there's this map of all the sites where sludge, uh, class B biosolids, and septage have been spread in the state. And we had some customers that asked us if we had tested because we're on the map. And I was like, what, they made a map? And I, I looked um, and I said, I mean, I think it would make sense to get some testing done. And they hired a, a fly-by-night operation. Oh, no, God, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they, they hired some testing done. And then just before Christmas that year, I got a call like as I was driving to Vermont um, saying, like, we got our test results and it seems like they're high. What does this mean? And I 
it's like, well, here's a little bit that I know, and we're going to have a lot more to talk about uh, and look into. And basically, I have become much more involved than I ever thought I would uh, as more farms. That, they were very public. They felt that the, the most important thing for their business was a strong relationship with their customers, and um, that they were also very upfront with other farmers, saying this is a health risk. And if I say nothing else, um, so well, okay, I'll get yes. to I'll get to that if I say nothing else. But um, uh, 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 so it it, uh, it kicked off a big thing, and there's been lots and lots of interest. Um, in general, my take homes. I'll say right at the beginning, are that the general food supply in the country, if you eat a diverse diet from a diversity of sources, it's not really a concern. However, if you're buying locally, like we recommend people do, and you just happen to get bad luck, or if you live in a rural area, these rural communities are potentially greatly impacted. And so I know families with very young children with five or six crowns even though they don't eat candy really, they brush their teeth regularly, it's because of one specific PFAS compound that was in their drinking water. And I mean, I can't say that conclusively, but all indications point to that. And it's um, one that's not being regulated by the federal government at all, right? So like what we know about PFAS and what we're talking about, and I'll bother, bother you later to say like, which compounds are you testing for in the sludge and in the effluent? because. It is an issue. Pam and I have spent a lot of time talking with people and like trying to help them understand some of the nuance because there are PFAS and there are PFAS and it's thousands and thousands of compounds and they're not all the same. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm doing a terrible job at limiting all the time. But, um, <laughs> I'm going to talk like an auctioneer. Let's hear it. Um, so. Uh, uh, oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, yeah, I got into it. I actually got into soil science because I was interested in recycling and, and uh, sustainable agriculture. And it, um, so I became a soil scientist after working for a company that recycled biosolids and, and paper mill residuals and ash. Uh, I went back to school and got a master's degree. My, fo my, my research was actually focused on manufacturing topsoil from a blend of uh, sand, just borrow of sand and uh, paper mill sludge and, and chicken manure. Um, but I um, currently work with basically every type of organic residual under the sun that might be used as a soil amendment. And we work with every type of farmer in New England. We do a lot of nutrient management planning. We work with a lot of compost facilities, anaerobic digesters. So we work with some of the biggest farms, some of the uh, conventional farms. We work with uh, bigger uh, organic dairies, but also very small backyard farms and things like that. It's impacted my, I mean, PFAS has really impacted our business um, entirely. We, um, we got into testing early because we were already working with biosolids and when this issue came up it was a red flag for us I, and that's sort of been part of my specialty in the past is looking into complex issues like dioxin, uh, polybrominated diphenylethers, all the things that might potentially be in our waste. Um, PFAS is a lot more complicated because of its physiochemical properties that are very different in soil than a lot of these other compounds. Um, but we did, we got into testing early um, and so we are uh, the company that found a lot of the sites that you read about in, uh, from Maine, some of the highly contaminated sites including around where we all live, including one of the organic dairies that I bought milk from to make yogurt out of. Um, so we, there was a year and a half where it represented about 20% of our work and it got so bad that people would associate our logo on our car with PFAS. So if we were going to do regular agricultural work, soil sampling, someone saw us go into a car, I've heard people talk about this and they're like, oh, that, that farm's in trouble. Um, so it's, uh, it's, fortunately, it's, that's gone down quite a bit. Um, it's not as big of a focus, but we do continue to work with it. We've gotten funding through MOFCA. Um, and the Maine Farmland Trust for, they have a grant program where people apply to get um, us to come out and do testing. Um, if they have some concern about potentially having it, we, we also have a grant from the USDA, which MOFCA has um, put some money into as well. It's looking at 
uh, for one of these farms is highly contaminated, looking at um, using biochar to try and reduce the mobility of the, um, of the PFAS so that it will not be taken up into plants at such high rates. It's kind of a similar concept to uh, pesticides using uh, char and pesticides in, in, in compost. Um, so it's, yeah, it's sort of impacted everything for us. We think about it quite a bit. Um, with it's, it's, like I say, unfortunately, it's gone down. I do feel like a lot of my time I spend talking about the difference between these very highly contaminated sites that are very problematic and the sort of everyday exposure that we get to PFAS and uh, trying to make sure that, uh, you know, hopefully things don't get too bent out of shape with people um, getting units of measure confused and conflating soil standards with water standards, things like that. Great. Well, How did I do? That was amazing. 202? Yeah, we, well, that's, well, what, that's what's left for the half hour. So. Uh, <laughs> but um, thank you all for that <clears throat> intro. And I'm now going to be very brief with my questions because we, I want to make sure everybody else has a chance. So I'm going to throw out a few questions at once. Don't answer them right now, but maybe work your answers into everybody else's questions if you get time. One, I want to point out the, the importance of perspective and the ubiquity of, of these compounds in our environment, in our clothing, in our things we put on our face and on our children and on our carpets and on our furniture, all that, compared to the numbers that we're seeing in soils and compost and biosolids. Um, so hopefully that'll come up. Um, and then Andrew, Pam, and Caleb, you all have lots of experience in Maine, where this has been front and center focus for years now. And I feel like Vermont, we're a little bit behind. We're still further than most of the country, perhaps. Uh, but we don't have the map that Maine has where biosolids, have, we'd like to know exactly where biosolids have been applied all over the state. And uh, we haven't been measuring and we haven't been sampling nearly as much as Maine has. And so um, I know we're on the early stages of that. So I'm wondering what Vermont can learn from Maine's experiences, both you know, like, I, there's, there's been some really good things that have come out of that and some really tricky things, no doubt. Um, so what can you tell us here in Vermont that we can do better? Uh, what, what, how can we learn from your experience? Uh, and then um, Amos and Pam, what, what is the game plan for Vermont? Like I know there was mentioned during the State of the State about the pollution prevention study that's up and coming. And maybe, I mean, you can speak to that at some point and tell us, uh, I know there's some funding available from the federal government. How is that going to be used? What are we going to learn? Uh, what, you know, I know from the composter um, perspective, most composts have not been tested for PFAS in Vermont. Uh, very few have. Uh, I'm imagining dairy and ag, that's a similar story, and, um, and nobody wants to be the first because we know there's PFAS out there, uh, but when we, what's the plan once we find out, oh, there is some number, it doesn't matter what that number is, but there's some number of PFAS in these things, what's that mean, how do we deal with it, because we know that people are going to have big reactions uh, because they because it is so complicated and because there are so many of these compounds and it's a really hard thing to understand even with a 10 minute elevator pitch, um, which most of us don't have 10 minutes, particularly with short attention spans and limited time in grocery lines and all of that. So those are my questions. Now, don't forget those, work them in, but let's open it up to because we now have 20 something, 28, 28 minutes left. Um, but. I'm sure some other folks have some questions, so let's open it up and hear what, and be loud if you can. The only microphones we have, I think, are the ones on the table, is that right? Yeah. So in an attempt to record that, uh, your voices, be loud. Um, who has a question from our panelists? Yes? Um, I'm usually pretty loud. You are. Okay. <laughs> uh, why would I test? Right? We, we've got some real concerns about testing. So can we talk about that a little bit? Like, what are my legal obligations after I test? What, what information am I going to get? And who do I need to share it with? And so why would I test? You mean as a composter? As a composter, right? Yeah. Thank so, you. So I'll say that part of why I've been giving talks in other states is because of this question. And when I was in Michigan, we were having this conversation. And just 
on Thursday I was in Maryland and we were having this conversation of can we crack this nut, investigate PFAS in different states without sending, and in, from my perspective, I'm thinking through farms primarily, uh, without one farm or a couple farms being the sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. Because in Maine, in Colorado, in New Mexico, and in Michigan, the first farms that had contamination went through the ringer. Um, and uh, so in Maine, there, there was that first farm, and it, honestly, it wasn't even on, really on the radar of the organization I work for um, until a couple years later, and then when it became on everybody's radar, um, the state was trying to set some things up, but we had some nonprofit flexibility of like, we can raise funds quickly, we set up an emergency response fund, and we were able to help farms that did want to test, uh, but were not necessarily going to be tested by the state in their investigation, uh, but they knew that their customers wanted it or their wholesale purchasers wanted it. Um, funding to have Andrew come out and go do testing for them. Uh, also, if their tests were high or uncertain, income replacement. Uh, the state has since enacted a $60 million uh, fund, and it is in place to uh, do the same things, you know, come in with income replacement for now up to two years. Um, for farms that are affected, they can uh, sell their, their farm at non-contaminated value. And basically the, the idea being that, yeah, who in their right mind would do this testing unless they knew there was going to be a safety net? However, the first veggie farms that did the testing and shared, and, and one of the dairy farms, and shared with their customers what was going on, where they were, and they, it, it, they had direct-to-consumer relationships already that they needed to maintain. But as they did that, except for one veggie farm who stopped um, before even, like they just stopped that season, the other ones that continued all, have all seen increases in sales because they've had support in making sure that what they're selling is safe or low enough risk, and they have, if anything, increased their customer's trust in them. Yeah, I'll, if I can add on, yeah. I, uh, that same, um, one of those dairies, organic dairies, um, that was very public right off the bat, um, yeah, I just talked to them the other day, and they, they said the same thing. Their milk sales are better than they ever were beforehand. It was, a, it was an incredibly painful year and a half, two years for them, very painful. Um, but there was the income replacement program, which helped. But I, the, the question I think is really good, um, because my opinion has changed on it over time. I used to think, yes, test, you know, you got to know. And I think that it really depends on where you are, because if you're at a place where you're testing and those test results go out and nobody has a perspective to put them in, you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, it's, uh, I, to me, it, it, and I've said this before, we're like, we've, we've tested over 500 samples at this point of everything under the sun, soil, water, milk, forage, meat, um, and even fence posts in one case. Um, and it's, you know, sometimes it's really hard to find non-detects. And so you're going to get, it's very likely in a lot of cases you're going to get a detect. And if you don't have somebody, if you're sharing that, say, with the state, the state doesn't know how to interpret it, and they, maybe it's a material they were already suspect of, and they see that it has PFAS in it, then they, that could screw the program. My feeling is if you have a like, if, if there's a sense that you have a material that might be high in it, um, like biosolids, I think it, you know it, the, the the program in Michigan has been really effective. Uh, that they've had a testing program, and they've actually gone upstream and found their sources of PFAS and reduced them. If you well, like in in um, Caleb's case, if you have, um, but you're going to talk about the bowl eventually. Um, it's if you not have just a, for tips, but yeah, you know. <laughs> if you have a compost um, it, that has a really high percentage of compostable foodware in it, especially these, then it might make sense um, to test. 
if you have something that, you know, there's enough data out there that you, it's probably unlikely that it would be anything other than background levels and you're going to have to share that data with someone that doesn't know how to interpret it, then I feel like, no, don't do it. I, I think to, if I knew what your feedstocks were, like if you're getting dairy manure and clean food waste with no non-food stuff in it and maybe leaves, you could test but you're going to get background levels. That's basically, that's in a nutshell, that's what it is. If you're getting biosolids, then it depends on where the biosolids came from. And then if you are including food contact materials, it's a, a real, real mess. And the short version is the organization I work for, we have a big annual event, three days, we have 60 some odd ticket holders that come. We make our own compost, um, poorly, but you know. 60,000. 60, uh, we make our, our own compost and, you know, because it's not a great facility, they've tried to be zero waste for a really long time and s they found that they were uh, not able to get the supposedly compostable stuff to, comp to compost. And so then they started so separating they had an army of volunteers, so they would separate the food from the food contact materials, compost the food contact materials separately with manure, and um, Those are good volunteers. They were, uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't know uh, how they can be so d committed. Yeah. Uh, so we once again uh, contracted with the fly-by-night organization to do some testing as it became pop a, a big issue. And we said, well, we haven't had this in-person in event in two years because of the pandemic, but we have this pile from 2019. Um, you know, everybody's talking about PFAS. We should know. Is it? I think, and uh, when I got the results, the way I explained them to other folks in my organization, as I said, they, they were impressively high. Uh, because we had inadvertently created the most PFAS contaminated compost on record in the scientific literature. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, and so for that reason, I said, can I have some funds and please can we make a paper out of this because I want it to get out there. There have since been a couple studies that back up our hunches based on what we found, which is that like fiber-based stuff is loaded. In 2020, a year after we had done that really bad compost, BPI created their, you know, enacted their standard, which says that there shouldn't be any intentionally added PFAS, and as a backup, they'll test, and they're looking for 100 parts per million of total organic fluorine, and that is through the roof, right? Like. It, it, I, there's total organic fluorine is a really important measure, especially if you're thinking of like biosolids, because there's so many PFAS compounds out there, and we can really only test for the ones we know we're looking for, and there's many more that we're maybe not catching. So it's good in that sense, but in terms of how high it could be, the other thing is that we picked these up with some food on Friday, and I was like, well, are they BPI certified? I don't see a label. So BPI certification is great if it's BPI certified, but you're telling me this isn't ending up in some composting facility somewhere? Like, we've already trained consumers to, to compost this. Uh, and people are doing it in their home composting. So as this breaks down, you could test this right now. The PFAS that you're looking for, you're not going to find that many. But come back to it in two weeks of composting, and suddenly the numbers are going to have spiked because these larger compounds are breaking down and releasing the PFAS compounds that we're looking for. So think of the term precursor compounds. Uh, there are lots and lots of precursors that turn into the PFAS compounds that we're much more aware of and better informed about. And so the biosolids, what's going out in them, PFOS, PFOA, as that's left industry, it's been decreasing slowly. But the precursors that then turn into PFOS and PFOA and other ones are still there or still there in high amounts, and they're not always tested for by any means. OK, thank you. Okay. Keep this, let this guy from talking. We're going to run out of time. Um, Eamon and Pam, what can you tell us about Vermont? Like, what's next for testing in Vermont? What, what is, I know there's funding. What can you tell us, like, and to answer Susan's question, like, why should we test? Is there going to be an option? Is it going to be mandatory? Are all organics facilities going to be asked to test, or is it only going to be voluntary? And who would volunteer 
If that's the case, can you speak to that? <laughs> no. Okay. No. Uh, <laughs> some of it, um, certainly not all of it. Um, I think it's a really good question. I think the wastewater plants were asking that at the gate too. They were afraid they were going to get singled out and regulated and their permits were going to now have limits on PFAS. I think Vermont has proceeded with a lot more thoughtfulness than they were expecting. And I think having a comparative data set is really important. So if you're the first composter to test and you've got data, it doesn't mean anything because you don't know you're going to get detections and you can't compare it to anything. You go to like the three papers in the literature and you're like, okay, it's in there. Um, so there is that risk and that is a concern for especially small grant projects that we have like our pollution prevention grant that we're looking at um, because we don't want to get a bunch of data that is confusing or very limited data that's confusing and then have that be used in the wrong way. So we're very cognizant of that. Um, I think in terms of the wastewater stuff, we've got enough samples now. I mean, we've got quite a good data set and we're building on that data set. And the goal will be then to, we can make those comparisons and look for places where we can make an effort with source reduction. Similar to how you'd look at your feedstock for your compost facility. It's, it's, it's a similar process. I, I agree with you 100% that these are problems. I mean, the legislature is trying to do their part by banning you know, food packaging containing PFAS. It's in direct contact with the food, as far as I understand. So not that doesn't necessarily matter when you go to compost it later. Um, but coated papers, right? We, we traded styrofoam for coated paper. And it's a regrettable substitution. And hopefully, the next one will not be regrettable. Um, but yeah, um, so most of our pollution prevention work right now is really small grants. The EPA provides uh, the state's pollution prevention grants, but I think DEC's goal at least is to build more in-house capacity for pollution prevention. So I think we'll see additional positions added, um, not just focused on wastewater, but sort of more broadly across ANR to look at you know getting upstream, working on how do we get the stuff out of consumer products, working with VDH and of health and others on us, um, and, and of course, ag. Great. All that right. was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. And ag. <laughs> Can I add a, a practical yes, add aspect? Practical. So from a farm output perspective in Vermont, we do not have standards. So you can test your commodity, but it's going to sit there in space. It, it's, not, it, it's not productive to do that. Um, from a grower perspective, I would want to know what my compost coming on farm is. But in that, that is one of the approaches for those highly um, concerned producers is to test your inputs coming on farm. It would be more valuable to do that than say, for the same, the same thing that you're concerned about, protecting your farm's reputation over time. If you're concerned about that, it's uh, a good approach to it. test what's coming on farm so you, you can diagnose where your problems might be coming online. But we can't compare it to extent anything right now. Okay. So are you, are you just talking about soil health? Do we, do we know, like, uh, crop uptake? There's some really fascinating work that we're going to have to lean on from Maine. And so each soil scenario is different. And that's one of the reasons you're not going to see like really um, uniform guidance going out to producers. So some PFAS get into some plants some of the time at different rates. And so Maine has done work looking at the difference between lettuce and kale, corn and corn silage, tomatoes versus tomato plants. And there, there's a lot, there's a growing body of literature out there that we can lean on. And that's part of how the guidance to growers is. It's like, OK, what do you normally grow? What do you need? What can you change in the future? And, and we can shift you away from those plants that take up a lot of PFAS to those that take up less, depending on the profile that you have present in your soils. But I think Eamon's data really points to the fact that Vermont is in a much better position than Maine, right? Like, we're, we're, we are talking of a different order of magnitude of management. Not that we're out of the woods. I'm just saying it, there's a difference. I, 
Don't be too complacent. No, I want right, complacency. Right? Uh, I just got here. Because I mean, <laughs> it, it, depending on the PFOS precursors, one of the, so I'm on one of these papers with the state of Maine that's in review, it's not yet been accepted, but, and we weren't looking specifically for this, but the biggest implication we have is that it is getting pretty well known, and, and the, the short version of where they go into plants is in leaf tissue. At least the PFAS of most concern, the larger molecules, the ones that we've known about for longer, they end up in the leaf tissue. So in vegetables, that's easy to think about, lettuce, spinach, kale. Um, however, when you think of things like kale, you've got that big midrib that's going to dilute it. So you're going to get a lower amount in the entire leaf. Do you eat the midrib or not? Right? But when you think about animal feed, hay, grazing, whole plant corn silage, problems. Uh, so if you have a dairy farm with some really heavily contaminated farms, maybe where they've been taking their hay from, their, their silage from, because it's further from the barn, it's harder to get manure there, that's where they're going to send the biosolids if they're buying, if they had gotten them previously. They might have fields around the farm that are much lower contamination. So then to manage it, uh, and I would say it's, you, it, it is a, a Vermont policy legislature you know, thing to decide whether they want to just piggyback on some of Maine's toxicology standards because they were calculated with national data, right? Like it should apply to anybody consuming milk or anybody consuming beef. But the, if you were to use those as a threshold value, then you would maybe find some farms that we're going to need to start being very careful about. All right, that field that we used to take hay from, we're now just doing uh, earlage, right? Where instead of chopping the whole corn plant, we're just taking the ears, husks and all, and doing that. And that we're getting our fiber portion of the animal diet from other fields that are lower and cleaner. And that's been one of the main mitigations that has been taking place. However, you do potentially get to a point where do you want to be the person who tries to convince somebody who's been a dairy farmer their entire life that you need to be a grain grower now? Growing grain is tough in the Northeast. Do you, you guess what? Now you're doing cut flowers and Christmas trees because you can't do what you've been doing your entire life. It's, it's not always easy. There are some, some steps and it's, there's some good, good news and some good resources, but it also is still early days, a little bit. But yeah, sorry, yeah. I don't want to. Oh, sorry, sorry. So we only have one question from the audience. Oh, we only have ten minutes left. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, Toby. So I'll try to keep to the questions, everybody. But uh, so this is a new thing, right? When we're all, and I, and I appreciate that the panel tries to mitigate the sort of what the is going on factor. Is there a way to tie back, so Maine, for instance, paper industry's been around for a while, we have the biosolids application maps. We have no idea where short paper fiber was distributed, and at one time there was a mill on every river every 10 miles. They're forever chemicals. Are we able to make that connection so in the event that a responsible packaging company is not intentionally adding PFAS to their products, we don't get wrapped up in this farm because uh, I will say, like, we're going to have the 100 parts per million detection limit is so that there's no intention to add PFAS. Just like the carrot, you don't intentionally add PFAS. In. So is there a way to tie back to the history of 480 compounds that goes back to the 40s when these high levels come up? Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question uh, that I can't answer. But in the, in the two minutes where I was introducing myself, the thing that I didn't say is my, my wife's from Central Maine, and her... Um, her father, her grandfather was an engineer at the mill that was in Waterville that made the paper plates, ironically, that caused, yeah, that caused um, the, the biggest, it's been the biggest source of problems here. And that is, as Pam says, orders of magnitude higher levels on those farms than, than other farms. And, and I have seen soil data from farms that have received biosolids in Vermont, so it's really different. But what I, I wanted to tie this back to what you asked about, or what you said maybe about questions from Maine. Um, actually, it's tying these two things together. I think something that Maine has done really well is looked at this in, um, in a non-sort of reactive way in terms of managing these farms so that 
we do know there's a big difference. I mean, grains, you can, you can harvest grains from some of, these, some of the most highly contaminated sites and not detect PFAS in it. And fruiting and vegetables, things like that, typically don't have them. And it's true. And so a lot of farms have made, where we ha have found problems, have made adjustments, just like Caleb was talking about, to get to the point where they actually, now their milk is fine. You know, so there are, if, if once you're there, you're not, it's, it's, you're not necessarily doomed, but as Caleb also pointed out, it's, if you're a highly contaminated farm, you're gonna spend a, f a few years and it's gonna be a shit show for those two years to get back to being, you know, a you profitable a lot of farm. Support. Yeah. All right, one more question. <laughs> Kelly. So we haven't seen a lot of those farms in Maine, though, or in Vermont. We haven't seen any highly contaminated um, and I would actually advocate against doing a map of all the farms or lands that have taken biosolids in the past. Um, it, I, I disagree with you, Andrew. I think it is a little bit reactionary, and people are going to go on to that resource and not understand the level of PFAS or, or um, what it means when biosolids were used historically or recently. Um, and stop going to that farm, stop buying their produce, stop buying their milk, and that's gonna have a bigger impact on that farm um, just because they took biosolids 10 years ago when they maybe don't have any PFAS. So, um, I'm sorry, not much of a question there, but just... Yeah, <laughs> but, but I mean, there's never gonna be a map of spreading sites in Vermont, right? Because we don't have the historical data. Well, why don't we just get to it? So the, the ANR Atlas, where we put a lot of our environmental information does contain records of PFAS testing results from all permitted and active land application sites as of 2019. Yeah, but now, if you were, if you were, if you were taking, if your great grandfather's uncle was spreading septage on your farm in 1975, it's not on the map, right? So there was a point in time in which the federal regulation kicked in 1993, not that long ago, and today. And then there are record keeping challenges associated with any large regulatory agency. And we are no, you know, we are not strangers to that. Um, Maine, to their credit, must have had a cache of banker boxes as big as this room to mine all this data from. We do not have that room. So that will not ever come to light, as far as I know. Um, so it's a little bit of both, right? And I can also agree with Andrew that I've, I've, I have, we have testing data that shows very, very minimal impact. Basically background levels. And let's make it clear, you could go outside and screen out here and take a shovel and it would come back with a part per billion of PFAS in it, probably PFOS entirely. And some farms are just right above that. Some farms are five times that. Some farms are a thousand times that. The tough part is then advising them and everybody else, on what does that mean and what do I do? The Maine has the most direct experience doing that, which is great. I think we're still working through a lot of science, right? I mean, there's a lot to learn still. Um, but I think we're getting a little more confident with the ability to advise people every year that goes by, right? We get more information, more data, more knowledge in our pockets to be able to say, maybe you should think about this, or maybe you should do this, or maybe we do need a regulatory standard, or maybe that, you know, right now, in Vermont, we have a groundwater standard. That pretty much drives the majority of our work for PFAS and a drinking water standard, obviously, but right now we're not really talking too much about drinking water. Well, there are really no relevant soil standards across the U.S. So, so someday there will be. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> um, so we only have a few minutes left, and I want to have time for one more question, perhaps. But I also wanted to throw out that this obviously was not been enough time. There's all we're just scratching the surface on this, and uh, we would like to continue the conversation for sure. Um, my pitch for CAV, Composting Association of Vermont, which is throwing this today, or putting this on today with ANR's support. 
is uh, that you should all be members because we will have compost conversations, we call them, once a month, uh, typically, where we will bring up a topic of interest such as PFAS, and we will uh, have more time to talk about it. So sign up, go back to the CAB website if you haven't already, if you're not already a member, become a member, and you'll get notified of those and be invited to join and be a voice in this ongoing discussion. Um, also, um, we can maybe go a few minutes late because we have at least 15 minutes before the next session <laughs> starts, but, um, more importantly, I think most, if not all of you, will be joining us at Pro Pig this afternoon, so you could do some one-on-one -on -one questioning of these folks with some alcohol on board, if, if you so choose, which may lead to better or worse outcomes, I'm not sure. But um, time for one more question, and then we'll give everybody like 15 seconds, or no, we'll give them 45 seconds each to give final thoughts. Any other, yes, another question, go ahead. So what's the future for biosynthesis? <laughs> What should be happening currently? Should they just be like burying cap like brownfields? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a, a breadth of responses. Um, first and foremost, I think, you know, I mean, we are working on this together, the two agencies, because it obviously affects farms. Um, we are seeing in Vermont, I think, a shift away on some level, the very beginnings of ag use. Um, a lot of that is being driven by companies like Andrews who are, who are working to make a manufactured topsoil and that is sort of the market doing that on its own. Right? Like we are not going around telling farmers, you shouldn't take this or you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't. I mean, we're not. So that said, if, if we've tested your place because you had a permit and you have high levels and it's impacted groundwater, we are going to, you're going to have to stop. Right, groundwater is a public trust. Right? Groundwater contamination means stop the activity, remediate if possible, which at this point really isn't, and uh, you know, characterize the degree and extent of the problem, and then keep an eye on it possibly forever. Right? So those folks, unfortunately, are heavily burdened now with this economic burden of doing that work. And they didn't do anything wrong. Right? They had a permit from the state. They spread some material. Nobody knew what was in it. And now it's like, what? What did I do? I didn't think I did anything wrong. It's a really hard conversation to have. Um, but I do think we're going to see a slight shift away from ag. I mean, you know, the days of permitted land application sites, like, you know, with a class B biosol, which is less treated, they're really declining. I don't see a future in that work. Can you explain so, does it, Yeah, it doesn't mean that there won't be biosolids. There will just be not be repeatedly applied to the same permitted site. Um, we've been basically trying to come up with a strategy, and I apologize for the time, that will hold Vermont soils, particularly ag soils, as sort of a background level, which is what we've established through our, our previous statewide soil sampling, which has been uh, backed up by Maine, Massachusetts, Everett, New Hampshire. They've all done them, and the numbers are similar, which is good to see. So that will basically be a at some point, probably a standard for soil that will hold, that will be based on the background soil levels of the state. It won't be based on, right now, we're not looking to do a risk calculation. It would just be to hold those levels. So if you go to a farm and you test this, and, and you have a material that's above those standards, you need to test the soil before you put it down. So the idea is that if you're below, if you're below background with your material, if you've made a manufactured topsoil with various residuals, and you're below background soil levels, you could put it down, right? But if you're above that, um, then you're going to need to take some additional steps and ensure that we're not creating hot spots. So that's the plan, but it's April 1 was the sort of kickoff for that. There are ways to go. I, I do have to add in, though, that this is where the precursors need to enter the discussion. Because the paper that I mentioned previously, the transfer we're seeing into forage crops, it's pretty consistent in the literature. There's a decent range. And then there's pretty consistent in main farms, because we have many different farms that have different sources of contamination. Sometimes it was one or two years from the really heavy contamination. Sometimes it was many years of lower contamination levels, but more volume over time. And of the fields where there are more precursors, the transfer into the plant of PFOS is much higher than it should be. 
because these precursors are transforming in the soil and around the plant roots. So the, the paradigm has been, we're looking at PFOS in biosolids, we're looking at it in soil, we're looking at it in plants. It needs to be, we're looking at PFOS and everything that's gonna turn into PFOS and what that will learn, turn into the plant. Because otherwise, you're just getting a little piece of the picture. And the other last thing that I need to throw out here that is another part of where people are starting to look is that we know that PFAS in the soils, other than the ones that are small and go into the water and quickly leach through, the ones that stick to soil particles are more likely to stick to silts, clays, and organic matter. What, as a farmer, are they going to be breathing in in airborne dust? Silts, clays, and organic matter. And also, what is going to stain your hands? And you maybe do a quick wash before lunch, and you're going to be ingesting some. Silt, clay, and organic matter. But when we are doing these testing results, we're doing it on a, bat, a, mul a bulk soil sample, right? So we're including all the sand in there. And if you have good ag land, there should be a fair amount of sand, and you are therefore underrepresenting the true concentration of the PFAS on the particles that you're gonna be inhaling and ingesting, most likely. More research needed. But if I were working at a composting facility that potentially had a lot of Dust. I mean, having been a farmer, I'm no stranger to the phenomenon of black boogers, right? Well, doing a lot of field work and you blow your nose and you blow your nose and it just keeps coming out black because you are inhaling dust. So for that reason, in terms of worker safety and consumer trust, I would, I would want to at least consider it. I know. It's like it's all bad news. And Andrew, any final words? Uh, no, I, I agree with um, I agree with a lot of what Caleb said. There are some things that we we haven't looked at. Um, I think it, yeah. It, in general, I would say, like, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if my plate's a little greasy. Um, I wish that we didn't have such a reliance on all of these things. Polybrominated diphenyl ethers is another one. It's like somebody found out it's good for um, resisting flame and then just put it in absolutely everything. And any time we're working with, uh, I mean, my passion is using our waste materials, organic matter-based waste, to build soil health and soil fertility, but we're always going to run into this. Those things that are byproducts are a mirror of what we're using, and we just have a love affair with all of these compounds that we probably could do without. Just one thing I forgot to mention in terms of the agencies working. Um, we are working with the Department of Health to come up, you know, to evaluate the risk to Vermont, similar to Maine. It's not necessarily that we're adopting without thought what they've done in Maine, but our health department is working on those numbers. Excellent. Well, I want to thank the panel. They've been great. We didn't have enough time. We hope the conversation will continue. Thank you all for coming and being uh, particip participants. So up next, yes, thank you guys. <laughs> We have 10 minutes before this room blows back up into a three, <laughs> three room size and we jump into the afternoon plenary, which will be the final hour and a half. Uh, so you've got 10 minutes to use the bathrooms, get some refreshments, go downstairs, talk to the vendors, and uh, we'll see you back here. Okay.